there'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover tomorrow. Richard Skate had taken a couple of hours away from the ministry to see whether his house was still standing of the previous night's raid. He was a thin, pale, hungry-looking man of early middle age. All his life had been spent in keeping his nose above water, lecturing at night schools and acting as temporary English master at some of the smaller public schools. And in the process, he had acquired a small house, a wife, and one child, a rather precocious girl with a talent for painting, who despised him. They lived in the country. His house was cut off from him by the immeasurable distances of bombed London. He visited it hurriedly twice a week, and his whole world was now the Ministry, the high heartless building with complicated lifts and long passages like those of a liner, and lavatories where the water never ran hot and the nail brushes were chained like Bibles. Central heating gave it the stuffy smell of mid-Atlantic, except in the passages where the windows were always open for fear of blast, and the cold winds whistled in. One expected to see people wrapped in rugs, lying in deck chairs, and the messengers carried around minutes like soup. Skate slept downstairs in the basement on a camp bed, emerging at about ten o'clock for breakfast, and these in prison weeks were beginning to give him the appearance of a pit pony, a purblind air as of something that lived underground. The establishment's branch of the Ministry of Propaganda thought it wise to send a minute to the staff, advising them to spend an hour or two a day in the open air, and some members did indeed reach the King's Arms at the corner. But Skate didn't drink. And yet, in spite of everything, he was happy, showing his pass at the outer gate, nodding to the home guard, who was a specialist in Icelandic customs. He was happy, for his nose was now well above water. He had a permanent job. He was a civil servant. His ambition had been to be a playwright. One Sunday performance in St. John's Wood had enabled him to register as dramatist in the Central Register. And now that the London theatres were most of them closed, he was no longer taunted by the sight of other men's success. He opened the door of his dark little room. It had been built of plywood in a passage, for as the huge staff of the ministry accumulated like a kind of fungoid life, all divisions sprouting daily new sections, which then broke away and became divisions and spawned in turn. The five hundred rooms of the great university block became inadequate. Corners of passages were turned into rooms, and corridors disappeared overnight. "'All well?' his assistant asked. The large-breasted young woman who mothered him, bringing him cups of coffee when he looked peaky, and guarding the telephone. "'Oh, yes, thanks. It's still there. A pane of glass gone, that's all.' And Mr. Savage rang up. Oh, did he? What did he want? He said he joined the Air Force and wanted to show you his uniform. Old savage, Skate said. He always was a bit wild. The telephone rang, and Miss Manners grasped it like an enemy. Yes, she said. Yes. R.S. is back. It's H.G., she exclaimed to Skate. All the junior staff call people by initials, it was a sort of social compromise between a Christian name and a mister. It made telephone conversations as obscure as a cable in code. Hello, Graves. Yes, it's still standing. Will you be at the book committee? I simply haven't got any agenda. Can't you invent something? He said to Miss Manners. Graves wants to know who will be at the committee. Miss Manners recited quickly down the phone. R.K., D.H., F.L., and B.L. says he'll be late. All right, I'll tell R.S. Goodbye. She said to Skate, H.D. asks why you don't put report in progress down on the agenda. He will have his joke, Skate said miserably. 
as if there ever is any progress. Do you want your tea? Miss Manners said. She unlocked a drawer and took out Skate's teaspoon. No teaspoons had been supplied in the Ministry after the initial loss of 6,000 in the opening months of the war. And indeed it was becoming more and more necessary to lock everything up. Even the blankets disappeared from the ARP shelters. Like the wreck of a German plane, the place seemed to be the prey of relic hunters, so that one could foresee a day when only the heavy Portland stone structure would remain, stripped bare, scorched by incendiaries, and pitted with bullet holes where the home guard unloaded their rifles. Oh dear, oh dear, Skate said. I must get this agenda done. His worry was only skin deep. It was only a game played in a corner under the gigantic shadow. Propaganda was a means of passing the time. Work was not done for its usefulness, but for its own sake, simply as an occupation. He wrote wearily down the problem of India on the agenda. Leaving his room, Skate stood aside for an odd little procession of old men in robes, led by a mace-bearer. They passed, one of them sneezing, towards the Chancellor's Hall like humble ghosts still carrying out the ritual of another age. They had once been kings in this place. The gigantic building had been built to house them, and now the civil servants passed up and down through their procession as though it had no more consistency than smoke. Long before he reached the room where the book committee sat, he heard a familiar voice saying, what we want is a really colossal campaign. It was King, of course, putting his shoulder to the war effort. These outbreaks occurred periodically, like desire. King had been an advertising man, and the need to sell something would regularly overcome him. Memories of Ovaltine and Halitosis and the Mustard Club sought an outlet all the time, until suddenly, overwhelmingly, he would begin to sell the war. The treasury in the stationery office always saw to it that his great schemes came to nothing. Only once, because somebody was on holiday, a king campaign had really got under way. It was when the meat ration went down to a shilling. The hoardings all over London carried a curt king message. Don't grouse about mutton. What's wrong with your greens? A ribald Labour member asked a question in Parliament. The posters were withdrawn at a cost of £20,000. The permanent secretary resigned. The Prime Minister stood by the Minister, who stood by his staff. I consider we are one of the fighting services. And King, after being asked to resign, was instead put in charge of the books division of the Ministry at a higher salary. Here it was felt he could do no harm. Skate slid in and handed round copies of the agenda unobtrusively, like a maid laying napkins. He didn't bother to listen to King. Something about a series of pamphlets to be distributed free to six million people, really explaining what we were fighting for. Tell them what freedom means, King said. Democracy, don't use long words. Hill said, I don't think the stationary office would... Hill's thin voice was always the voice of reason. He was said to be the author of the official explanation and defence of the Ministry's existence. A negative action may have positive results. On Skate's agenda was written, 1. Arising from the minutes. 2. Pamphlet in Welsh on German labour conditions. 3. Facilities for Wilkinson to visit the ATS. 4. Objections to proposed bone pamphlet. 5. Suggestion for a leaflet from the Meat Marketing Board. and 6. The Problem of India. The list, Skate thought, looked quite impressive. Of course, King went on, the details need working out. We've got to get the right author, Priestley or somebody. I feel there won't be any difficulty about money if we can present a really clear case. Would you look into it, Skate, and report back? Skate agreed. He didn't know what it was all about, but that didn't matter. A few minutes would be passed to and fro, and King's blood would cool in the process. 
To send a minute to anybody else in the great building, and to receive a reply, took at least twenty-four hours. On an urgent matter, an exchange of three minutes might be got through in a week. Time outside the ministry went at quite a different pace. Skate remembered how the minutes on who should write a suggested pamphlet about the French war effort were still circulating indecisively, while Germany broke the line, passed the Somme, occupied Paris, and received the delegates at Compiègne. The committee, as usual, lasted about an hour. It was always, to skate, an agreeable meeting with men from other divisions. The religious division, the empire division, and so on. Sometimes they co-opted another man they thought was nice. It gave an opportunity for all sorts of interesting discussions, on books and authors and artists and plays and films. The agenda didn't really matter. It was quite easy to vent one at the last moment. Today everybody was in a good temper. There hadn't been any bad news for a week, and as the policy of the latest permanent secretary was that the ministry should not do anything to attract attention, there was no reason to fear a purge in the immediate future. The decision too eased everybody's work. And there was quite a breath of larger life in the matter of Wilkinson. Wilkinson was a very popular novelist who wanted to sound a clarion note to women and he had asked permission to make a special study of the ATS. Now the military authorities refused permission. Nobody knew why. Speculation continued for ten minutes. Skate said he thought Wilkinson was a bad writer, and King disagreed. That led to a general literary discussion. Lewis from the Empire Division, who had fought at Gallipoli during the last war, dozed uneasily. He woke up when they got on to the Bone pamphlet. Bone had been asked to write a pamphlet about the British Empire. It was to be distributed, 50,000 copies of it, free at public meetings. But now that it was in type, all sorts of tactless phrases were discovered by the experts. India objected to a reference to Canadian dairy herds, and Australia objected to a phrase about Botany Bay. The Canadian authority was certain that mention of Wolfe would antagonise the French Canadians, and the New Zealand authority felt that undue emphasis had been laid on the Australian fruit farms. Meanwhile, the public meetings had all been held, so that there was no means of distributing the pamphlet. Somebody suggested that it might be sent to America for the New World Fair, but the American division then demanded certain cuts in references to the War of Independence. By the time those had been made, the world fair had closed. Now Bone had written objecting to his own pamphlet, which he said was unrecognisable. We could get somebody else to sign it, Skate suggested, but that meant paying another fee, and the Treasury, Hill said, would never sanction that. Look here, Skate, King said, you're a literary man. You write to Bone and sort of smooth things over. Louders came in hurriedly, smelling a little of wine. He said, Sorry to be late. Had to lunch a man on business. See the news? No. Daylight raids again. Fifty Nazi planes shot down. They are turning on the heat. Fifteen of ours lost. We must really get Bone's pamphlet out, Hill said. Skate suddenly, to his own surprise, said savagely, That'll show them, and then sat down in humble collapse, as though he'd been caught out in treachery. Well, Hill said, we mustn't get rattled, Skate. Remember what the minister said? It's our duty to carry on our work, whatever happens. Yes, uh, I didn't mean anything. Without reaching a decision on the poem pamphlet, they passed on to the meat marketing leaflet. Nobody was interested in this, so the matter was left in Skate's hands to report back. "'You talk to him, Skate,' King said. "'Good idea. You know about these things.' "'Might ask Priestley,' he vaguely added, and then frowned thoughtfully at that old timer on the minutes. "'The problem of India. "'Need we really discuss it this week?' he said. There's nobody here who knows about India. Let's get Lawrence in next week. Good chap, Lawrence. 
Malm said. I wrote a naughty novel once called Parson's Pleasure. We'll co-opt him, King said. The book committee was over for another week, and since the room would be empty now until morning, Skate opened the big windows against the night's blast. Far up in the pale enormous sky, little white lines, like the phosphorescent spore of snails, showed where men were going home after work. There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Tomorrow, just you wait and see.